new or visiting with us, let me just take a minute to welcome you. Let me welcome everyone, but uh, if you are new or visiting with us this morning, uh, we're glad you're here. If you're not sure exactly what's going on, uh, we have gathered to worship the Lord this morning, and uh, we are delighted to have you join us. Uh, if you would like to get connected in some way at some point, uh, I know it's like right out of the gate and it's weird to say it now, but if you, uh, throughout the service, discover that you have needs, um, if you want prayer, if you want to get connected to this church, there are um, cards in the seat backs in front of you. And so we would encourage you to go ahead and fill one of those out. Um, if you've been coming for a little while and you are interested in uh, continuing the relationship, moving forward with Piney Ridge Church, uh, worshiping the Lord with these people in this place, uh, there are ways to do that as well. Uh, one way to learn more about Piney is to attend the Lunch with the Pastors after the service coming up on November, wait, third. All right, November 3rd, uh, Lunch with the Pastors. So lunch is on us. We uh, just ask that you respond by filling out a card, sending an email to PRC Pastors. Uh, at pineyridgechurch.org or getting on the Church Center app and filling out a registration there. These are all ways that you can learn more about who we are, what we do, why we believe what we believe, and how we operate as a body together. Uh, and then lastly, if you're interested in joining Piney Ridge Church, or at least finding out more of what that means, we have a, a Covenant Members class coming up. Uh, October 20th, and that'll be running for four weeks, and it's at four o'clock each of those Sundays. So uh, mark your calendar or ask uh, one of the pastors if you want more information or sign up on, on uh, Planning Center. Uh, these are all great ways to do this. All right, can you rise with me? I'm already risen, sorry. <laughs> Please rise, that's what I meant to say. All right. We gather every Sunday to worship the Lord together. The gathering of God's people is a particularly special way that we proclaim to the world his glory and his goodness. And, uh, and so when we gather, we're doing a lot of things. We're singing. We're hearing the word read. We're confessing together. We're receiving the word preached. We're taking communion. We're doing all of these things as God's gathered people as a way of proclaiming that his mercy is sufficient, that he is gracious and kind. He is powerful and willing to call a people, to call a people out of their sin and death and rebellion, to move them into new life, give them new hearts, set them free in the gospel. That's what we gather to do, to hear those truths, to show those truths, to proclaim them, to receive them. And we get to do that together. We get to do that on display to a world that does not yet see or believe or cherish these truths. And so let me call you this morning, regardless of where you're coming from, regardless of your current uh, emotional or mental state, if you had to rush to get here, if you've been anxious all week, if you're not sure how your job is going to work out, how your marriage is doing, how your kids are going to turn out, if you're not sure about any of that, let me encourage you to come this morning with your eyes fixed on the, the true state of things, that God sits on the throne, that he is king over all, that he sent his son Jesus to make peace between us and him, that we have trusted in him and he has proven himself good and powerful. We don't need to come to him begging. We come to him simply making our needs known and saying, Lord, if you were willing, you could make me clean. And Jesus says, I am. I am willing. And so let us lift our voices to that God this morning. Let us praise him for the kindness he has shown. Worship him in majesty. Oh, 
good news. The word of God is unchanging. It's firm. It is promises for us are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. And so we trust him.
all circumstances. Believing that he is working for our good. Sing this. Even when we are dead in our sins, the Lord came to us. He loved us despite ourselves. And when my heart was cold and lifeless, and I wandered in my blindness, you pursued me. Eight, um, possibly the the most read from chapter in our worship gatherings, um, but it is so rich that it is uh, it is worth going back to and mining from over and over and over again. Uh, we just sang, um, as I'm sure most of you are aware, we sang a uh, that chorus references Romans chapter eight, which is going to be at the end of this passage that I'm going to read. I'm going to start in verse eighteen. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. How much, how much peace would we have if we actually, actually believed this? That there's no comparison between whatever the worst suffering may be right now. It's not even worth comparing when we consider the glory that will be ours. Going on, verse 19. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain 
and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. So we wonder why there are things like destructive hurricanes. It's part of the groanings of creation. Creation itself is feeling the effects of the fall and the resulting curse. But not only, verse 23, not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. If we have true hope, true hope in the resurrection of our bodies, we will wait for it with patience. We will hope enables and gives birth to endurance, patient endurance. But we are weak, and so the apostle goes on. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Praise the Lord. Let's glory in Christ Jesus, our hope.
Amen. You can have a seat. Now we've, we've sung that song a number of times and um, never fails to encourage me and, um, and also challenge me because um, I think in verse, in verse 2 where it says, um, talks about the goodness of God and then says that God is the one who, in fact, holds our faith when our fears arise, which is good news. He stands above the stormy trial. This, this is, we love to proclaim this, that yes, God is sovereign over every stormy trial. But then the next one says, who sends, the next line says, who sends the waves that bring us nigh? He's the one who sends the waves that bring us nigh. That's near. That's old school language for near. Nigh means near. To the shore, the rock of Christ. So, God knows in his sovereign wisdom that we need waves that will actually push us towards life, uh, towards Christ who is our life, that, that we don't need to just float on a calm pond because we'll spin in circles, we'll stagnate, we'll be in the muck that grows in ponds. We need waves that will actually push us to the shore, push us towards Christ who is our rock, who is our anchor. And we don't think that we need those waves most often. We would rather avoid the waves. But God in his wisdom is over the storm. He's also over those waves that are sometimes feel like they're pounding against us. But he's doing that out of his goodness, out of his love to push us towards Christ who is our rock. And so would you join me now in prayer going to Christ? God calls us to to come to him, to cast our cares upon him. It's one of the things that he gives us trials for so that we will do that. So let's go to, let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you for your wisdom. We thank you for your sovereign goodness. We thank you that you are, that you are God over all storms, both real, physical, and metaphorical storms. We praise you that we don't have to fear any storm because we trust in you, the Lord of the storms. I pray this morning, God, that we would grow in our, grow in our faith, grow in our belief that you actually are working all things for our good, even storms, even trials, even things that are painful and confusing. That you are working all of these things for our good. God, we ask for those who are dealing with the aftermath of a real, literal, physical storm in the South and in North Carolina, and all those areas, Lord, that have experienced so much devastation, so much loss of property, some loss of family members and friends. Lord, we ask for you to continue as you have been to show your love through the compassionate actions of others. Lord, we pray that uh, all of the confusion that surrounds all of that, that you would bring order to it so that help can come more quickly to those who need it. Lord, for those who are in desperate need, we pray that they would turn to you so that whether they live or die, that they would be held, that they would be certain, that they have the hope that we sing about, the hope of Christ, so that if they should perish in this, they have the sure hope of resurrection. But Lord, we ask that you would, you would spare lives, that those who cry out to you now would live lives proclaiming your glory, your rescue, your power, and that when they call to you, you answered. Lord, for those believers who are there serving, as I know many are, and we pray that they would faithfully serve, that they would serve with, with wisdom in the ways that are most helpful. God, in all of those situations, there is so much uh, confusion. It's hard to know where to even start or what is most helpful. So, Lord, we pray that you give discernment, give guidance, Give the supplies that are needed. We pray for protection for brothers and sisters that are there serving. We ask that you, um, God, give them 
hearts that are uh, compassionate not only to meet physical needs, but to make clear to those that they're helping that their greatest needs will not be met by, um, by shovels and, and, and bulldozers and even money, but their greatest need is to know you. And so I pray that those who serve would have those kind of opportunities because they're serving there. Lord, we ask for you to glorify your name in that situation. We ask for you to glorify your name among us this morning. We need you. We are dependent upon you. So we ask, Holy Spirit, that you teach us. God, be gracious to us this morning. Help us to see how deep our need is and lead us to trust you to provide what we need. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we are, uh, if you've been with us any amount of time, um, we have a fairly consistent liturgy. That's just uh, old, old uh, traditional word for the order of service, the liturgy. It's fairly consistent. We are changing it up just a little bit today, not drastically. But um, normally we talk about announcements and events at the end of our gathering. We're not going to do that. We're going to do that right now. It's happening right now. So um, get out your phone, if you would. Open up the Church Center app. It's always risky asking people to get their phones out in a worship gathering. But, you know, if you're going to be tempted by that, you probably already have it out anyway. So Um, so in the Church Center app, if you go to, uh, what is it, signups? Yeah. There are a number of things there you can sign up for. The most um, urgent, let me say, of those that we want to point your attention to today is uh, the Fall Festival. And I'm going to let Tanya share a little bit about the needs that we have for the Fall Festival. Fall Festival. But we have needs for the Fall Festival. Let me just say that. And she can give you some more details about that because she is the events coordinator helping to coordinate the Fall Festival. Thank you, Nathan. Um, Well, I have no notes, so there's no telling where this will go, but I'm going to do my best from my brain, which can be very scary. Um, So, yes, we have a great opportunity. If you were here last year for our Night of Thanks, we had talked about how our focus in 2024 is that we really wanted to try and have some community outreaches and opportunities for us to serve this community around us. Uh, We don't have too many. So we have decided that this year we're going to be doing a fall festival in place of Trunk or Treat, which we've done for years past. Um, And this is really just a focus on inviting community, and obviously if you attend church here, you're welcome to come as well, Um, just to reach or open our doors, um, invite them in, and let them have a couple hours of good time where we're serving them and their families with hay rides, face painting, we have a balloon artist coming, um, some fun things, and we have lots of carnival-type games that we're doing. We all be, will be providing some food as well. So with all of these things that we have, we need your help in order to pull it off. Uh, the four people on the events team, while these ladies are amazing, we're not amazing enough to do all that by ourselves. So everyone who has signed up so far, thank you so much. That relieves a lot of stress off of me when people are signing up, but we need more. And if you're intimidated because you see game attendant, you're like, uh, well, what am I going to do with the game? These are simple little carnival games where all we really need you to do is smile and welcome people in and maybe give them a little bit of direction on the game that they're playing, but it's not going to be anything that's too overwhelming. I mean, I plan this, by the way. It's going to be easy stuff because I can't do anything too overwhelming anyway. Um, so that is really where we need it. If we don't have enough game attendance, then we're just going to have to start taking stuff off of the roster that we're offering to the community. And we really want them to come in and enjoy the two hours, not come in and be here for 10 minutes and then walk back out the door and be like, oh, that was terrible. Uh, so please, 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 I beg you. This is a great opportunity for ages 13 and up to serve in this manner. Uh, so Ridge, young adults group, we need you to come out and maybe we'll have more of you than we will adults. And we'll show them how it's done. How about that? Um, But I would also say we know it's a hard time when you have children and a family and things like that. And so, you know, what what we do is we always, one parent will serve here and the other one will be with the kids. And that's a great way to split up. Or I know it's a busy season for um, sports and things like that. So if one parent is, 
I hate to say it, maybe would have to miss a game, and I know that could be hard because I remember when my kids were in sports and doing things. But if you could sacrifice that one opportunity to come and help us out that day, we would really greatly appreciate it. We'll need help setting up, we'll need help tearing down, and we'll need help during the event. So we would love to have you come and help us out. And then I have one more announcement that wasn't approved, but I'm going to say it anyway. Young Adults Group, we have a chili and bonfire on October 26th at Shane and Renee Berry's house. And you can sign up for that in the Church Center app as well. Thank you. Excellent. And you are now hired to do the announcements all the time. Okay. So, Congratulations. I will decline. See? See? I, I resign the job. You can have it. <laughs> um, yeah. So... You got your phone out already? You can go ahead and just sign up right now. We're going to be taking a few minutes to uh, transition, taking kids to Piney Kids. So you got some time. You can just, instead of being friendly today, you can just be on your phone signing up for uh, Fall Festival stuff. And then be friendly after you do that. Um, one real quick thing before you start moving. Um, we are also, the day after the Fall Festival, going to have our... Third Sunday Gathering, Scripture and Song Night. It'll be here at 6.30. We would love for you to put that on your calendar and make plans to join us to praise the Lord during that time. All right, so if you want to stand up and uh, if you need to check your kids into Piney Kids, you can do that, or you can sit down and look at your phone and sign up for Fall Festival. We will be back in here in about five minutes and hear from the preaching of the Word.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Could make your way back in. Grab your seats and as you come in and sit down, would you uh, join me in prayer, asking the Lord's blessing on our time. <clears throat> Father, we need you and we thank you for your abundant grace, the mercies and goodness you've already shown us today, that you've promised us in Christ and uh, that you give to us so many rich blessings that we do not deserve. But because this is who you are and what you've promised, we ask for more. We ask that you would bless us through your word now, that you would speak, and that you would change us so that we leave more focused on, hopeful in, and worshiping the Lord Jesus. Help us to live and move and breathe and do all things in his name and for his glory. And that is how we pray. In his name, amen. So, uh, when we just prayed right there, maybe raise your hand if you closed your eyes when you prayed. Most? Yeah. Um, Why do you do that? The Bible doesn't command you to close your eyes when you pray. I don't know if you knew that. There are actually examples of people praying with their eyes open in the Bible, Jesus being one of them. Um. But I think it is practically a good idea often that we close our eyes when we pray, mainly because it helps to remove distraction from us, right? It helps us to focus so that we can pray with our attention where it ought to be. We're closing our eyes, we're removing other things, removing distractions so that we can stay focused, and there is no one more worthy of our undivided attention than God, right? Right? And when we're praying to him, talking to God as our Father, it makes sense, it is good and right that we would give him our full attention. But notice also what you're saying when you close your eyes and you pray to God. You're saying, I don't want to be distracted from other things because those other things are less important than him. And automatically you're also saying that there are other things that we cannot see. When you close your eyes and you pray to God, you're saying there is more than what our eyes can behold. Our five senses are a wonderful blessing from God, but they are not reliable guides to what is ultimate. Our five senses are not reliable guides to what is most important in this life. Love, truth, faith, these things cannot be handled and experienced through our senses. These are realities that are deeper and go beyond the physical realm. God himself is spirit, and he is ultimate. There is a spiritual realm behind, um, around, beneath, above, in and through all the physical realm. And this spiritual realm is where the war is most fiercely fought. And it's where, where the war is most important, because we battle not against flesh and blood. And you can be sure that the devil and his demons don't sit idly by waiting for some bad thing to happen, waiting for for people to sin and suffering to occur and God's name to be dishonored. They are actively, fiercely engaged in trying to make it happen. They seek to change the course of the war by changing how people think and feel and act and live. Now, that's not to say that someone can make the excuse, well, the devil made me do it as though they're unaccountable for their sinful choices. No, indeed they are. We all are. But the point I'm making is that they are not as free as they think they are. No one, no one makes any decision or has any action that is completely free from spiritual influence. No one. There is a spiritual, spiritual realm behind the physical. Now, perhaps you say, ah, I don't buy it. I don't see it. I can't, can't taste it, touch it, smell it. I, I can't hear it. I can't. It, 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 I know. But if you can't see that Satan had a hand in Idi Amin's massacres, his genocide in Uganda, or Stalin's brutality in the Soviet Union, or Hitler's Nazism in Germany, 
then you also cannot see Satan's hand, his influence in the abortion industry or internet pornography or in the LGBTQ plus movement in America today. Maybe in your mind, he might not as well exist. See, the truth I'm trying to convey to you is that sins in our culture and in every culture have direct ties to the devil and his demons. Even if they are hidden, because that's how they like to keep them. The dragon we read of in Revelation, the book of Revelation, is real and powerful and fierce and cunning. Oh, so sly. He's a clever enemy. So what he does is he works not only in and through people, individuals, but in and through whole institutions and organizations. And, and he works in and through systems because he can do more damage this way. His lies infiltrate these groups, these major systems of our world, so that he can then utilize them to spread even greater evil and destruction in this world. This is true in entertainment and in art and in sports and in technology and in government and even in religion. And these last two, the government and religion, are what we're going to focus on this week and next week from Revelation chapter 13. That's because Satan is always attempting to corrupt governments and religions in order to dishonor God and destroy his people. He's always attempting to pervert, to twist, to corrupt governments and religions because he wants to oppose God and his people. But that makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, if you were out, set out to control the world, if you could only pick two spheres to, to kind of put your hands in influence, what would you pick? Government and religion. These two systems, these two areas have more influence. They have their hands in literally every part of society. All of culture is affected by these two realities. So in this week's passage, what we're going to see is the first of two beasts. Two beasts. The first coming up out of the sea, the second one later next week coming up out of the land, out of the earth. The first of these two beasts that we'll see today in Revelation 13, 1 through 10, he represents this satanically empowered and corrupted governing authority that blasphemes God and persecutes the church. The beast, in this sense, becomes the agent of the devil, opposing God and his people. And we'll see in this passage how the, the world responds to the beast in worship, and how we, the church, are supposed to respond to the beast and his war. So if you would, grab your Bibles and stand with me in honor of the reading of the Word of God this morning. Our sermon text is Revelation 13, 1 through 10, but we're going to start actually in verse 17 of chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, starting at verse 17, would you hear the word of the Lord then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet like a bear's and its mouth like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its wound, mortal wound was healed. The whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words. And was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. 
If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. In this passage, we have, as I said, the first of the two beasts, the beast rising up out of the sea. And this beast represents the satanically corrupted governing authority that is anti-Christ and anti-Christian. How do we know that? How do we know that that's what this symbolism is representing? I'm going to give you three things. Number one, because he's rising up out of the sea. He rises up out of the sea. The sea is always, in the Bible, representative of chaos of mystery, of evil, of darkness, and of rebellion. And every time, every single time in the Old Testament that there is a metaphorical beast or monster coming up out of the sea, without exception, every time it represents a king or a kingdom, a ruling authority that comes against the people of God. And John knows that, and he's using that here. But... It's a strange picture we have of this beast with ten horns and seven heads and crowns on each thorn, uh, each horn. It, it, it sounds weird and it's strange, but it's not arbitrary. It's not random. It comes from the Old Testament book of Daniel. So you can keep your finger there in Revelation 13. And turn with me to Daniel chapter 7, please. I read several different verses here in Daniel chapter 7, and you will see that John is just picking up what Daniel had to say. In his prophecy, in Daniel chapter 7, starting at verse 3. Prophet Daniel, chapter 7, verse 3, reads, And four beasts, great beasts, came up out of the sea. There we have our first connection to Revelation 13. They're different from one another, these four beasts. And then it says, the first, in verse 4, was like a lion. Verse 5, it says, And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear. In verse 6, after this I looked and behold another like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back and the beast had four heads and dominion was given to it. Verse 7, and this I saw, after this I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it and it had ten horns. Again, in Revelation 13. We see so far that what, da what, what uh, uh, Daniel says here, John picks up and he sees them as one image. All four beasts kind of combined together in this one grotesque creature coming up out of the sea. And, and here's what we see in verse 17 of Daniel 7, why this is representative of governing authorities. Verse 17, these four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. Then verse 19, then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest. And we read in verse 20 that about, he also wanted to know about the ten horns that were on his head. Verse 21, as I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them. That's what we read in Revelation 13. The beast was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. Then we see in verse 23, thus he said, as for the fourth beast... There shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. So it's kings, and these are kingdoms. These are governing authorities. These are ruling powers. It says in verse 24, As to the ten horns out of this kingdom, ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones, and he shall put down three kings. Verse 25, He shall speak words against the Most High. This is the blasphemy we read of in Revelation 13. And he shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change the times and the law, and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a times. We've read that several times in the book of Revelation. That's three and a half times. That's three and a half years. That's 1,260 days. That is 42 months. So we read of in Revelation 13. All of this is uh, that, that John is using in Revelation 13 takes us back to Daniel 7 and saying that these kings, these rulers, these governing authorities and powers are being represented, uh, represented as one beast in Revelation 13. Therefore representing all the beasts and therefore representing all kings and all kingdoms who oppose God and his people. And back in Revelation 13, we see even further that in verse 1, 
This beast has ten horns and seven heads and ten diadems. Horns are a symbol of power and of ruling authority like we read of in Daniel. The heads, these are leaders or those who have authority. Diadems, these are crowns, those who has crowns but those who are in authority. Look at verse 2. It says, And to it, to the beast, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. Who has power and a throne and great authority but governing rulers? These are powers that be. Verse 4. They worship the dragon for he had given his authority to the beast. Verse 5. It was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. Verse 7. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. As one commentator says it so plainly, this beast signifies all beastly empires of the past, present, and future that oppose God and his people. That's what the beast of Revelation 13 is. You have a governing powers that oppose God and God's people. There you find the beast. This is the agent of the dragon, Satan's weapon. And how does he use this weapon? Revelation 13, 7, it was allowed to make war on the saints. It was allowed to conquer the saints. From the Apostle Paul, who was imprisoned in Rome, to a pastor in Nigeria named Zechariah that I read about earlier this year, he came home to find his four children abandoned because government came in and raided his village and murdered his wife. Governing authorities came in to kill this woman because she was a Christian. This is the beast. From Nero in the first century to Kim Jong-un in the 21st century, Satan has his hands in the governments of around the world to try to corrupt them to oppose God and his people. Chapter 13, verse 2, we read that the beast is like a leopard and a bear and a lion. These are predators. They destroy, they devour, they kill. Now, let's take a step back for a moment and let's be careful. Not every government, not every governing official, not every politician or every government agency in all the world that has ever been or is now is the beast. Just because someone is of a different political persuasion that, than you are, or they're in a different political party than you would vote for, don't label them as having ten horns and seven heads. In fact, <clears throat> there are some politicians that you may agree with on nearly every point of politics. That if you were to call them out and rebuke them for their personal life, they may want to do what Herod did to John the Baptist and say, off with his head. Now, just because it is true that not every politician or every government is the beast, it is also true that there may be some form of beastness in most governments. In most governments around the world and throughout the history of the world, there have been those who want to oppose God and his people. Because Satan is always attempting to corrupt governing authorities in order to dishonor God and destroy his people. Satan is always wanting to twist things in the government that God had made for good for the protection and the flourishing of people. Satan wants to corrupt it to stand against God and oppose his people. But the key identifying mark of whether some ruling authority is beast-like is not if they hold to your particular, uh, your particular politics or not, but rather if they blaspheme God and persecute the people of God. That's the beast. You look at verse 1. On his seven heads, <clears throat> he had blasphemous names written. Verse 5. And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words. Verse 6, it opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. It's talking about the people of God. The beast blasphemes God. Blaspheming is slandering God. Blaspheming is 
dishonoring God often by trying to dethrone God and deify oneself. That's blasphemy. Um, now, it is true that in the early um, centuries of the church and throughout the world, throughout history, there have been some like Nero and others who claimed to be God and demanded to be called and treated as such. But it need not be that overt. I mean, is it not a kind of blasphemy for a king or a dictator or a president or a politician to speak of themselves or their governing rule as the hope for humanity? That they are the salvation for society. That's something only God is and can do. Or what about demanding absolute obedience without question? Again, something that only God deserves. In North Korea, they have um, lots and lots of laws, some of them really bizarre. Uh, you look back in the history books of America, there are a lot of weird laws. But in North Korea, they still enforce a lot of these strange laws. Do you know, in, if you are 17 years old or older in North Korea, it is mandated you have to vote, even if Kim Jong-un is the only one on the ballot. You have to vote under threat of penalty. And if you fall asleep while in the presence of Kim Jong-un talking, you can be put to death. And in fact, in 2021, that happened. A guy was shot by uh, in, in a crowd of over 100 people because he fell asleep while he was talking. And if in, in North Korea, if you are found possessing pornography or the Bible, it is the same consequence. In 2014, there was a, an American man who was in a hotel there and left his Bible on accident, and a maid found it, called the authorities. It was confiscated. He was arrested and detained for five months because he accidentally left a Bible in a hotel room. They demand in North Korea absolute obedience under threat of death. But when you demand unquestioned, unquestioning loyalty, absolute obedience, who deserves that but God? When you put yourself in that place, especially when you're telling Christians, you will obey me instead of God, you are beast. One commentator says, Satan puts blasphemies in the mouth of the state so that it proclaims, I am God, not in so many words, but by demanding from its subjects a total, unconditional allegiance, such as those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will never give to any but Christ. And when Christians do refuse to hope in or praise or give unconditional allegiance to their government, but instead only to Christ, it may cost them severely. They read in verse 10 of Revelation 13, if anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. In Iran or Sudan, Yemen, Somalia, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, and many, many other countries in Asia and in Africa, mainly Muslim countries. It is illegal to express your Christian faith. It is illegal to try to convert others or to con be converted into Christianity. And the range of consequences are wide. You could be ostracized or you could be executed. Clearly, the dragon's beast is at war with the saints, both in the past and in the present. But it is, it is important to remember that the beast does not represent any one person or any government in particular, but rather corrupted power that stands against God and opposes God's people. And by the way, there is no middle ground. You either are for this power of the beast or you are against it. Either you stand with God as his people, or you follow the beast, the dragon, against God and his people. That's it. Those are the only two options. Two options. In verse 4, we read, And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given it his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? You hear what it said. They worshipped the dragon, and they worshipped the beast. Verse 8. And all who dwell on earth will worship the beast. So you ask, are you saying that either your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, verse 8, that is, either you are a Christian or else you worship the beast? That's exactly what John says. 
You say, but yeah, but I know a lot of non-Christian people who don't love their governing authorities. They don't even like politics at all. How do you say they worship the beast? Well, it is about worship. Satan will have it no other way. That's what he's after. He wants everyone to stop worshiping God and to worship him, even if it means worshiping his, his puppet, this governing corrupt authority that is anti-Christian. See, people worship the beast, they worship the dragon often without knowing it. In part, this is why Satan makes the beast a counterfeit Christ. He's a copycat, an imitation, a pretend. I mean, both Christ and the beast, they have horns, they have crowns, they have names on their heads, their followers have their names on their foreheads. They are worshipped, they have power, and so many other things. The beast is trying to be like God. This is blasphemy. But uh, Satan does this in order to make it easier for people not to worship Jesus, but to worship the beast, the dragon instead. But how do they worship? How do people worship the beast, especially when they don't even know they're doing it? Well, often it's not with, uh, by singing songs or burning incense or praying prayers or offering sacrifices, though at times and places in history that has been the case. That's more intentional. But often today it isn't hoping in or giving unconditional allegiance to the governing authority that is anti-Christ and anti-Christian. Either the actual authority or even just the idea of the ruling power. Some put their hope in the possibility of their favored party winning or their favored politician getting elected or their favored policies being enacted. And thinking that all will be finally as it ought to be if politics goes the way I think it ought to go. People prize power. It has always been the case. That's why they say, who is like the beast and who can fight against it? Oh, so powerful and mighty is he. And when your team is winning, when your government is leading the charge and has great power, it's easy to prize that power. But people also fear power. And it's for both of these reasons that people worship the beast of political power and governing authority, because they see that their government has the power to secure for them or to give to them what they so most want out of this world. Or they're afraid that their governing powers, the powers that be or that could be, could take away what they so love in this world. And so they're afraid of it. And this produces a kind of loyalty to some political party or politician, some king, some ruler, some governing authority, or even some form of government. And people will follow these leaders, they hope in, and to some of the darkest places in the world. When Adolf Hitler showed up on the scene, he was the Messiah of the German people. He was said to be their savior. He was finally coming to set them free from, from the oppression of the world, and he would bring them in, uh, usher in their utopia. People were so devastated after World War I that they said, man, he, he's confident. He's powerful. My hope is renewed. There's, I see light at the end of the tunnel here. I want to follow him. And they followed him into such great evil. But most... Most just out of fear or out of apathy, honestly, will simply go along with their leaders. They follow down that path to increasingly anti-Christ and anti-Christian culture. And this, too, is a kind of loyalty. It's a kind of worship. Because you're giving yourself over to the beast. You see, the only way to not follow, to not worship the beast, is not to make sure your policies and your politicians get elected. That's not the way to do it. That could actually be giving in to the worship of the beast. The only way to make sure you don't worship the, this satanically inspired, anti-Christian governing authority of the beast is to worship the lamb, is to give yourself fully to him. Oh, but the dragon and his empowered beast will not put up with that. They are at war to stop you at all costs. 
So we read in verses 9 and 10. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. This is a call. This is a sign telling us this is the application for you. If anyone is to be taken captive to captivity, he goes. And if anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. So here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. That's the application. This is to be the response. When the world worships the beast, the church is to endure the beast with faith in the Lamb. Endure with faith. Is that it, though? I mean, if your government continues to grow in its anti-Christian ways, anti-God ways, its blaspheming ways, it sounds like maybe John's just telling us to grin and bear it. Nothing you can do. Just kind of throw up your hands. Just endure and have faith. Does that bother you? That this is all he says? Surely there's more that we ought to be doing, right? Or maybe you say, ah, but wait, wait, I see. Maybe, maybe it's the issue is there. John was writing in a different time, in a different context, a different, with a different political system of government. And they didn't have representative form of government. They weren't, he wasn't going to, they had an emperor who was like God to them. They didn't get to vote, especially these Christians. They didn't get to vote for amendments and, 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 and uh, propositions and policies. So you say, see, that's the difference. Well, it is different, yes. But we need to be careful here. We need to note carefully what John does not say that he could have said. When he says, here is the call for endurance, the endurance and faith of the saints, he does not say, here is the call to take up arms, to take your sword, and to fight back and take your culture. He doesn't say that. Though some of them might have wanted to, might have been willing to die for it. That's not what he says. He doesn't say, here is the call to demand to be heard so that you can convince your governing authorities to follow Christ or at least to, to submit to this God-honoring institution of how government should be run. That's not what he says. Though some of them maybe were willing to, maybe even some tried to do that. That's not the call here. The call to endurance and faith, he, noticed he, doesn't also, he also doesn't say, here is the call to love your enemies, to bless those who persecute you, and to pray for your governing authorities. Though that is surely what they also have done, because the Bible says to do that as well. My point in this is that, yes, there are many other things that we today in um, America, in the 21st century, ought to be doing. It's not exhaustive here in verse 10. This isn't everything that we are supposed to do in response to government or even to corrupt governing authorities around the world, we surely ought to love our enemies and pray for our governing leaders, and we ought to vote. And there are other things you can do. You can inform others about political issues. You can seek to convince them of, what, of how they should vote and how they should see things. You can campaign for a political party. You can even run for office yourself. All those things are permissible. God does not tell us here, I don't care about anything else, only do this. That's not what he says here. But I think that he includes this because he says, if you're going to do anything, make sure it's this. He doesn't tell us everything, he just tells us the most important thing. If, if everything you vote for gets passed this election, if everything you vote against fails, if everything turns up your way of your, to your political advantage, but in the process, you begin to think and speak and act like the world who follows the beast and worships the dragon, you have lost far more than you could ever gain. To paraphrase Kevin DeYoung on this passage, he says that it's not, it's not that God doesn't care about anything else that we do when he says, here is the call for the endurance and faith of the saints. He's saying what he most cares about. God cares most, not that you affect change in a corrupt world or even a corrupt government, but rather he cares most about that a corrupt government and culture does not affect change in you. Because what does it profit a man if he gains the whole political world and yet loses his soul? The call here is to endure with faith in the Lamb. So don't hope in or devote yourself 
to a politician or political party. Don't even apathetically and mindlessly follow some democratic republic system. Hope in Christ. Devote yourself to him alone. What does that mean for us? Practically speaking, that means, yeah, you can stay informed on the political issues of our world. But don't be consumed. Don't be obsessed. If you spend three to five hours a day watching YouTube videos of your favorite political pundits, but you spend little to zero time reading God's word, something is seriously wrong. If you watch the news and you watch your podca- listen to your podcast, but you don't pray, you're not considering how you can serve your neighbors or share the gospel with the lost, then your priorities are messed up. So yes, yeah, stay informed. But don't be obsessed to stay and don't be consumed. Vote. Yes, vote. But not out of fear. My goodness. I cannot stand listening to politicians who constantly, and every one of them do this. You need to vote for this. Every political pundit, vote this way, because if you don't, the whole world's going to fall apart. It's all on your shoulders. Be afraid, be very afraid, and I'm going to motivate you by that fear to go and vote. I'm not saying that if you don't vote or if you vote for bad things that there won't be negative consequences. Surely there will be. But being motivated by fear is not God-honoring. Be motivated instead by faith, that you believe that God is sovereign and he can even work through your ordinary, everyday acts of obedience, the yes, like voting. And be motivated to love your neighbor. Sometimes, uh, throughout my life, I have, I've never really been a huge fan of politics, in part because it's so complicated. It's, It's complex. It can be really difficult. But some issues, especially more and more so all the time, it seems, are becoming more and more clear. So, it... One, one guy said that recently that it's not as though we're debating anymore the, fine points, uh, the finer points of the tax code, but rather we're debating on what is the definition of a woman or a man. We're debating whether or not government has the power to take from God the redefining power for marriage, or whether an innocent, vulnerable human life can be destroyed or not. This, is, this is, makes it really clear for me. What does God's word say? In the state of Missouri, we have, I think, at least seven amendments and one proposition coming up in November. And a lot of them, um, I, I think all of them important, and we can think through and speak about them in different ways, but Amendment 3 is one I think that we can be very clear on. We're going to be doing a podcast about it um, later, uh, soon, as pastors, but when a state puts up an uh, amendment that says, hey, you can destroy human life just even if you don't feel emotionally up to keeping that life, we know where we ought to vote. We know what we ought to do. We seek to love our neighbors, yes, our unborn neighbors. And honor God and vote, not out of fear, but out of faith. This is how I love people. This is how I honor the Lord. And you can debate. You can talk to people about political issues. You can debate using very clear, courageous, direct arguments and strong words. But two things. Number one, if your main message coming out of your mouth all the time is political this and political that, but not gospel this and gospel that, again, you missed it. Don't let the main thing, the thing you're most passionate about, the thing you say most frequently, be about some political issue and not about the gospel. And there are ways even to talk about, as we ought to, political issues to turn it back to Jesus, back to Jesus as Lord and as Savior. And when you do debate these political issues... Do it out of, with humility and love. 
Beloved, I am sick and tired of people telling me you have two options and two options only. You can either be a coward who compromises and doesn't stand up for the truth and what's right, or you can be a self-righteous, arrogant jerk. I reject those as lies from the dragon-inspired beast. I'm going to follow Jesus, and I'm going to stand up for the truth and do so in love and with humility trusting that God will work. And we ought to pray. We ought to pray for, yes, our political opponents, those on the other side, and yes, we ought to pray for those who even would persecute us and pray for our governing authorities, pray for this election, pray for Amendment 3 to fail. We should pray for these things, but also and primarily so, we ought to pray that we and all the people of God would endure with faith in the land. We ought to be praying mostly that people would come to submit to Jesus and trust him as Savior and Lord, that God would be glorified not only in how people vote and how they engage in politics, but they would do so sincerely and purposely with faith in the Lord Jesus. We ought to pray because it has been and it will be until Christ comes again that the beast of the sea is making war with the saints. And we should always be on guard against this dragon-manipulated powers that seek to destroy us as we seek to endure with faith. The beast of the sea is an agent of the dragon. And all who follow him, this follow this anti-Christian ruling power, are really just worshiping the devil, even if they don't know it. And most don't. The dragon and the beast have power. Great power power, great ferocity, great cleverness, and they use it to oppose and to imprison and even to kill saints for the entirety of this age. However, however, I want to give you three comforting truths as we close to help you as the saints endure with faith. Number one, God is sovereign. No beast, no governing authority, no ruler, no king, no government, no, not even the dragon himself is sovereign only God. Verse 5 in Revelation 13, and the beast was given a mouth. It was allowed to exercise authority. Verse 7, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them, and authority was given to it. By whom? By the sovereign God over all the universe. He gives them this power, and he can take it as he wills. The power of the dragon and the beast is given and dependent, and therefore it's limited in its ability, what it can do, in its extent, how far it can go, and in its time, how long it will last, only for 42 months. That is only until Christ comes again. And when he comes, the dragon and the beast will be utterly and completely and forever destroyed. So even if to captivity we go, even if with the sword we are to be slain, God is still sovereign over that because he is allowed them to make war on the saints and to conquer us. And so we ought to pray and to speak and to vote passionately, but we also ought to sleep peacefully because our Father is the sovereign God over all. Number two, not only is God sovereign, but not everyone worships the beast. It says everyone will worship the beast. All who dwell on the foundation, on the earth, will worship it. That is, everyone except those whose name are written in the Lamb's book of life. Not all worship the dragon. Not all bend the knee or put their hope in the ruling power of anti-Christian government. In fact, none of God's true people do so. We're not alone. I read this past week of a, uh, a believer in North Korea who found a radio program illegally and listened and heard the gospel and was saved. And he said, I may be the only Christian in North Korea. Now, it's not true, but he doesn't know that. He said, perhaps somebody else will find this radio broadcast and be saved. And then he said something that broke my heart. He said, one day I hope to meet a fellow believer in Jesus Christ. Can you imagine feeling that alone? Look around you, brothers and sisters. We're not alone. Not all bow before the dragon. Not all bow before the beast. There are many There are many in this room and in this country and in this world who still worship the Lamb. And it will be so until he comes. 
we're not alone. And number three, comforting truth to help us endure with faith is that the saints have had their names written in the Lamb's book of life from all eternity. And it will be so for all eternity. So no matter what the beast may threaten or may do to us, even in death, our hope is sure. Our inheritance is secure. Our future is set. Our destiny is inevitable. You see, the call to endure with faith in the Lamb is really the call to don't give up. Don't back down. Don't give in. Don't worship the beast. Don't worship the dragon. Keep following Jesus. Keep trusting in Jesus. Keep hoping in him. Keep worshiping Christ alone, for he alone is worthy. And, and, because in the end, he wins. He wins. And for those of us who are in Christ by faith, so will we. I'm going to close by reading Daniel 7. A few verses. Daniel sees these visions of these four beasts, and it terrifies him. Daniel 7, 15. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this, so he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. He said, these four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever, and ever. And he says, as I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them, that is, until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. And this beast with all of his horns will come and prevail over the church, the people of God, and speak blasphemy against the Most High. But one day the court shall sit in judgment. Verse 26. And his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. And his kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. We will receive all the kingdom power in all the world under King Jesus. That's our destiny. That's our hope. No matter what this world does, no matter what the dragon or any beast does, God is sovereign. We're not alone. And our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and no one can take it out. That's our hope. But this hope is only found in Christ. We receive the kingdom only in Christ, our King. So this morning, if you're not trusting in Jesus, if you're not putting your faith in Christ, who he is as the Son of God who became man to live sinlessly and obediently, to die on a cross in the place of sinners like us, bearing not just our sins but the punishment for those sins. If you're not hoping in all that Christ has done to save you from the wrath of God and to promise you eternal life in him, then you have no hope. You have no hope in this world or in the life to come. So, when others come up to partake of communion this morning, if you're not trusting in the Lord Jesus, don't come up. But stay where you are and pray. Bow your head. Humble yourself before the Lord. Turn to him. Turn to him and find that he is king, that he is life, that he is savior. And if you are trusting in the Lord Jesus and your hope is in him and it's been affirmed by all the Christians in baptism and in just a moment you can exit to the left and come up to one of these tables or to the back to one of those tables and grab the communion elements of bread and juice representing the blood of Jesus and the body of Jesus given over for sinners like us. And go back to your seat taking it with faith, with faith in all that it represents, with faith in the Lord Jesus, with faith in all these promised and renew your unconditional allegiance only to him. Ask him to help you to endure with faith in him no matter what. And for those who should come, whenever you're ready, you may do so.
Bring